Hello, welcome back to the Cyclist Magazine podcast, brought to you in association with Castelli. I am your host, Joe Robinson, and I am joined, as ever, by Mr. James Spender. James, how are you doing? It's looking lovely and sunny in East London today, despite it being November. Yeah, no, it is. It is lovely and sunny. Flowers on the uh, balcony are still doing all right, even though it is is November. Although I've got um, uh, some kind of leafy mould on mm. the pansies. And I think it was because we had some very, very clement weather mm. and it was very damp. And I basically, I didn't read the instructions and I planted the pansies too close to each other and the leaves didn't aerate. So according to the Royal Horrible. Cultural Society, <laughs> it's game over. It's game over for those bad boys. But the cyclamen are doing well. Good. How are you doing, mate? I'm all right. I'm out of um, isolation now, which is good. I can experience the out- outdoor outside world. Um, but like you, I experienced some inclement weather. So my first ride out of um, lockdown, I test. I took out on my first test ride a new set of Roval Rapid CLX wheels, which are, you know, perfect for winter as they cost uh, £1,800. Uh, but I rode them in the pouring rain and they got really muddy and very slick. And um, obviously, like the braking was fine because they're disc brakes and they performed really well. But they're caked in mud now. So um, that'll teach me for sending a new set of hoops out in terrible weather, I guess. <laughs> well, I mean, on that note, you just reminded me, I, I went for a, a mud, literally the muddiest ride I've e- not ever been on, but for a long, long time, gravel ride on uh, the Stayer bike that I was telling you about last week. And it's like the trails are like soup because it's just been raining and it's really kind of claggy in Epping. I guess more like less of a like a... a cream of tomato which is liquidy more of a like a, i don't know a, a pea and ham which has got a bit more thickness to it yeah it's a real it would be something very potato based yeah kind of like a Mug- mulligatawny maybe or mm, i don't know is that a particularly thick soup i'll go leek and potato okay yeah so it's real leek and potato out there and i got i was just literally i was just covered in mud and there's this really dodgy car wash at the end of my street called the miami car wash <laughs> class yeah exactly go figure they're always I, I, so only cleans ferraris <laughs> only, well it's always got really broken expensive cars in the back so i don't know where they're getting them from anyway i went in there and i was like mate would you uh basically hose me down for like two quid and so he was like no 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 fiver so he was settled on three pounds and he just literally loved it like he, he i could tell he really enjoyed power uh, power washing the bike and then he was just like do you want me to do you and i was like all right and so he's just like <laughs> and literally man i'm like I was like backing off. I was like, "You're gonna, you're, you're gonna push the skin off my bone." It, it would be like in um, what's the film? Uh, no Country for Old Men, when he goes around with the air canister, yeah, killing people. I was surprised that didn't happen to you. I'm glad that didn't happen to exactly. you, James. That's that's how they that's how they get wafer thin ham off off the bones. Is it they is. Jet wash it. it is. Yeah. that's how they get. That's what wafer thin ham is. So yeah, that was but that was he. Yeah, he just he just found it hilarious because obviously. They were like working their uh, their behinds off in this like cold damp um, car wash thing, and then some like <laughs> fancy looking dude comes in and like her, just like, "Hello, can you please uh, <laughs> wash my bike down?" Anyway, so uh, sorry, that's a bit of a tangent. Mud, lots of mud, glorious mud. Cool. So today's episode, listener, is good one because we got on the phone. Well, I say we. I got on the phone with. Recent Giro d'Italia runner-up, Jai Hindley. Jai is a young upstart from Australia, riding from the excellent Team Sunweb team. Uh, he, alongside eventual winner and Brit, Theo Gagenhart of Ineos Grenadiers, crashed onto the scene at the Giro, uh, upstarting um, and overturning the likes of Vincenzo Nibali, Jakob Fuglsang, Rafa Maika, to take the race by storm, really. He took the pink jersey into the final stage, the time trial in Milan, where he and Teo were dead heat on time after 20 stages. He then unfortunately lost the race. Uh, Teo beat him fair and square in the time trial. But it was a massive breakthrough performance for Jaya. So we thought we'd chat to him about that Giro, he winning on the Stelvio stage, almost not being able to put his jacket on at the top of the Stelvio why Team Sunweb have suddenly become this insanely good team that win everywhere after kind of almost going into obscurity last year. And also what it was like growing up as a cyclist in Perth, um, a place where it's very flattened by the coast, yet he is an incredible climber. So it's a good interview. So we're looking forward to listening to that, and I hope that you are as well. 
But before that, me and James are going to rattle through a few things in the cycling world that have taken our eye and impressed us over the last couple of weeks. So, James, please let me know something in the last two weeks that has really impressed you in the cycling world. Really impressive. Well, um, first up, it's the 15 year anniversary for World Bicycle Relief. And that isn't something that's just Sporting a t shirt, listener. You can't um, see this, but I can. Yeah, I got. I, yeah, actually, that's. I, I just realized I'm wearing that. That's not. That is a genuine coincidence. Um, yeah, so they're celebrating 15 years uh, in the handing out bicycles game. So basically, if you're not aware of uh, World Bicycle Relief, uh, they are getting bikes, particularly in. Um, in Africa, getting bikes out to uh, communities where you got to do a lot of walking unless you're cycling, and you can yeah. go a lot, a lot further on a bicycle. It is a it is a means of transport. It's obviously also fun, you know, but like it's there as a means of transport. And so they have Buffalo Bikes as their kind of house brand, and I think they get all kinds of help from across the industry, from SRAM. I think Giant do some assembly in their factories, mm. um, and the bikes themselves cost $99 effectively so you know you can really see how your money is getting turned into a set of wheels and it's just a great it's an amazing venture I really really rate them I think that more people should be riding anyway yeah they they do they do really good work and they have done for a long time as you said 15 years now so so yeah so World Bicycle Relief I've been loving and then on top of that we were talking about soups just now. I've been really loving butternut squash. It's in season. Quality vegetable. It's a quality vegetable. It makes great soups. It's a good friend of tarragon. It's also a good friend of coriander. Mm. My top tip is you take the seeds and you do not throw them away. You take off the little membrane and you roast them and they make a great little garnish with some yogurt in your butternut squash and tarragon soup. So that's what we're liking. Well, bicycle relief and massive root veg. Root veg. Exactly. How about yourself, mate? What's been going on in the world of Joe? What have I been like? Well, I've I've like I've enjoyed, despite us being in lockdown part de, um, I've enjoyed my isolation coming to an end, being allowed to go out and explore the open world again, being out on my bike, something that I will never take for granted again. Two weeks of just sort of sitting indoors and not doing much was pretty boring. Um so I think that's what I've been enjoying in terms of like specifically the bike world. Um, as I said, I've got a new pair of Roval CLX wheels. I haven't tested them to their max yet and they are 1800 pounds. So I'm pretty sure that I'll have some stuff to say about them, but they have turned a few eyes in the lanes, in the Kent lanes. I actually took the bike and I took myself out to a climb called Layman's Road, which is for anyone who lives in South London will know it because it's basically the route that everyone takes to get out of London and into sort of Kent or Surrey. It's a lovely little two kilometer climb. And I went on along on it last weekend and I saw, I reckon I saw 60 people in a two kilometer stretch on bikes, on road bikes. And in that 60 people, I didn't see one person breaking the new guidelines on exercise. Everyone was either on their own or in pairs, but everyone was just out exercising in the good weather um enjoying it there was no cars on the road it's pretty early and I, I just sort of went oh this is this is actually really good isn't it this is one of the few silver linings that we've experienced during this awful year that we've all had to face is that in our little industry of cycling people are riding more and enjoying being outside and exercising and being and experience freedom with cycling, something that why we do it and that other people are sort of discovering it Absolutely. or rediscovering it because we all had it as a kid. So I'm really, I really sort of had a bit of a moment on Layman's Road because I was on my own. And I was like, oh, wow, this is beautiful. Like, and also everyone's really impressed by my 1800 pound set of wheels. <laughs> <laughs> that's, the, that's the real takeaway is you're, you're just glad you've got an audience. But what do you mean? Like that is a silver lining of lockdown. Because we always talk about 2012 being this big boom in the cycling industry mm. because of the Olympics, because of Brad winning the tour. Um, and it was, but it only, it reached a certain type of, of, of person, basically. Um, maybe it reached, reinvigorated people that were already cyclists. Yeah. Or it kind of tempted um, a new crew of people who might have been doing other sports into the world of cycling. Mm. But ultimately, those two groups of people are kind of, kind of there already. They're kind of sporty. And whereas... 
what I'm seeing at the moment, and if you look at the uh, headlines around bike sales, you know, you can't get a low end bike for love nor money. And that's because people are just going, Joe, you know what? I want to just ride a bike for, for leisure. That yeah. word leisure, it's not exercise, it's not training, it's leisure or transport. And it's a whole new group of people. And that I think is only going to be an incredibly good thing, especially for popular cities and stuff, because it's getting, you know, kids and elderly people and young, you know, it's just so it's just it's just branching it's it's cycling is exploding basically that's what yeah and fingers crossed it lasts through the the winter months because obviously that's the big test right is yeah we know that riding through the winter is an awful undertaking at times but we do it we we, we do it because it's our sport and and we know that the good times will come back and i just you know part of me hopes is that those who got a bought a bike for the first time in april in march and in, in may earlier this year because we was in lockdown or the people that have just bought bikes because we've gone back into lockdown and the gyms are shut again, get through December and January when it can be quite grim. And then remember what it's like riding in April because that is beautiful and riding in May and riding and riding again in the summer. Yeah, absolutely. What's your favourite month? Uh, to ride in? No, or just in general? Favorite, general. Well, it's, my favourite month's May because I was born in that month. My favourite pro race is the Giro, which is also in May. Um, and I have quite a bit of uh, a sort of nostalgia around the FA Cup because it's always around my birthday and the Champions League final. So, yeah, it's, the, it's May. <laughs> have you ever thought it's weird that April, May and June are women? Yeah. There's names. Yeah, and autumn. And autumn. Not a month, but yes. And and July, but we just pronounce it Julie. Weird. <laughs> Isn't it? Isn't it? Isn't it? Right. Well, you know, moving swiftly on. <laughs> anything you don't like, though, James? Anything you, Anything that's not been enjoyable for you? Um, just a bit of just actually. Do you know what? I've got this Nog light, and it's called a. It's called the Nog Cob light, and it is basically a. If you imagine a toilet roll, and you cut it in half, it's mm-hmm. that kind of shape. Obviously, it's smaller, and it goes so it wraps around the front of your handlebars or the back of your seat post. So it's that yeah. shape. Yeah. 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 So it's effectively got 180 degrees of kind of um, of lighting, loads and loads of LEDs. They're cob LEDs, which is a certain type of LED. It's arranged in a row, mm. and it's just like if you want to blind the actual rider by this light, because because <laughs> it doesn't have because it, it basically shines up into your face because oh, because it wraps around 180 mm. degrees. It's just the maddest thing. I'm like I've never met a light that's actually more dangerous than no light. <laughs> the rear ones, the rear ones, brilliant because everyone can see it. Yeah, like, just imagine like pointing a light into your face just about that's basically and riding with well uh, the only reason you do that is trying to be spooky around halloween yeah it's so just... and I, I can assume that you're not doing that while riding around east london no 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 no, no. exactly so yeah that's really <laughs> that's like it's beggar's belief other than old products can be great this one not so much um but how about you, Are you anything you know you, or is, is life just a bed of roses for you joe because everything now looks different after isolation no uh, the only thing that's got me down is that the cycling season's ended you know uh, true. um it was it was a great you know it was a season that i didn't think was going to happen or at least to the extent that it did so massive hats off to all the race organizers who managed to put on three grand tours we got four of the monuments we got the world championships we you know we, we didn't get as many women's races as we would have probably liked but we managed to get some um and you know what? This new calendar where everything was sort of in different dates was so intriguing. Watching races, watching different elements of races come into play because you're ri- racing Strada Bianca in Milan San Remo in the middle of summer and then you're riding Flanders and the Vuelta in winter. I thought that was amazing. And I definitely think this is something that's been discussed on other podcasts and then by other people is that maybe the UCI should be like, okay, we can change the, the calendar because this actually showed us that there was some good stuff that we could get from maybe grouping San Remo, Lombardia and Strada Bianca together and then hosting the Vuelta later. So but I'm just sad that it's all over because we didn't have it. Then it happened all within, what, 70 odd days and now it's over and now you just want it. But luckily, we've only got to wait till February, which really isn't that long away uh, yeah. for biking, bike racing to be back and, you know, you know, we may have some form of vaccine come the turn of the year. So things could be really looking up. So I'm going to be positive 
James. Be positive. Be positive <laughs> and also uh, get into cross. Get into cross. I, see, I would. See, I love riding gravel. I love riding off-road, especially in the winter. And I do like watching cross. But because I'm in a flat that I now own myself and have to clean myself, it's not clean for me by my mum, I'm not going to do that. <laughs> <laughs> fair enough fair enough right so i am intrigued by our interview your interview with yeah mr jai hindley so can we roll it please can i have a little listen go for it so what are we like two weeks on from the giro now um you finished second you eclipsed cadell evans previous best australia finish at the, at the race you wore pink in the final stage. You lost pink on the final stage, but you finished on the podium. Is it? Is it all sunk in yet? Have you started to process? Uh, yeah, a little bit. I don't know. It was yeah, everything sort of just exploded. You know, the past like the last um, two three days in the in the duo there, and it was like yeah, I was sort of just like take it as it comes and try not to worry too much about everything else and just try focus on on doing the the best race possible that I could um but yeah afterwards you know like when when the dust settles, was like after the race it's a bit yeah a bit like mind-blowing when you like look back and um yeah I don't know just yeah when you look back and realize like what you've done and yeah it's pretty special you know so mm. Yeah, also doing like all the interviews and getting messages off people and yeah, it's been like pretty phenomenal. Because I, I was, so I was like obviously doing a bit of research about you before this interview and I saw that like the Australian press, for instance, covered you quite extensively when they sort of realised that you were doing really well. So that must have been quite crazy for you to suddenly get not just the cycling press but you also get an interest from like the nationals out in back back home. Yeah, yeah, there was uh, like ABC and that sort of stuff. I did uh, interviews for, and also like um, Seven News, which is yeah, like pretty big Australian TV channel back home. So it was like pretty cool. I don't know, just to get some mainstream media recognition. You know, it's also really nice. Because yeah, cycling isn't really like the biggest sport in Oz, and I'm I think the the AFL Grand Final was on, like <laughs> coincidentally, like the last couple of days. So you know, the duo just got swept under the rug, which is pretty understandable. But I'm not like dark or anything about that. You know, I appreciate like all the support I got from back home, and yeah, I was going to say you're lucky it weren't this week the duo because State of Origin's on now, and like. Doesn't the whole country <laughs> shut down for a state line. So it has been like push royal to the back. That was okay. But, um, oh, man. Yeah, it may as well not have even happened, you know. <laughs> yeah, lucky you went there at the well. <laughs> um, so, but back to the jury. So you went in as a, you did go in as a protected rider alongside Wilco. So you had some support from the team about some GC expectations. But what were your expectations on day one? back you know three and a half four weeks ago what was you expecting from that race like we the, we, we went in with like two leaders so me and Wilco were like protected guys and to be honest I was pretty uh, I don't know just a bit nervous I guess because I hadn't I hadn't done like I'd never done a grand tour as protected leader and I also hadn't really done anything to sort of like warrant that either in my opinion you know what i mean i had like some good i don't know rides at like some week-long races but i don't think i'd really done anything mm. in the grand scheme of grand tour racing to go for gc so that was like a bit okay cool but i don't know how it's going to go sort of thing and then uh <laughs> yeah i was i was i we yeah we, we did like heaps of training at altitude we did like two three week altitude camps and we were just with the duro team there and we we're just training the house down basically so i knew like the form was going to be pretty good but i didn't know yeah i didn't know i'd have like the legs that i did have and now i was sort of just hoping for to scrape like a top 10 or something you know yeah, yeah. and then when you're almost like winning it it was pretty that was pretty nuts mm. you know to just mentally to wrap it around that to to think you're just going for a top 10 and then 
you yeah you're rolling into Milan in pink on the last day was yeah it's still uh, still just mind blowing you know but yeah. at the same time just such an awesome experience and yeah I mean hope like riding for GC is something that I've always wanted to do and hopefully it yeah opens up a few doors for the future. So so what, was there a moment? Can you remember a moment in that race where you went? Oh, actually, I'm I'm not just going to scrape the top ten. I'm I'm in it for for real here. Yeah, I think I think after the Pianca Barlow day when uh, the first days at Teo won and Wilco was second and I was third. I think that day, then I knew okay, I've got better legs than what I thought I had, and we can yeah, I was moved up to third on GC that day, I think. And after that, then I thought, okay, like I've got a good shot, maybe going better than top 10 on GC. And yeah, but I also knew there was still, there was still two time trials yeah. to come. So I wasn't too sure about how the end result was going to be, but then I also know like ground tour racing is pretty unpredictable with guys like falling over in the last week. And, you know, if you just keep, doing your own race and doing the best you can do every day, then uh, eventually which, it works out for you, you know? Which is like testament, which is proof because the day that you won, the laggy de Cancano stage up the Stelvio, that was proof that, you know, half the GC guys were obliterated halfway up the climb. And then you turn around on the Stelvio and it's just you, Teo and Rowan left with like 40k still to race. I watched back. I watched the uh, the decisive week documentary that the your team did. It's quite cool. Yeah. And I remember. I think. I think like Wilco radios in and says like I can't keep the wheel. So how how do you have to then like completely switch from being supporting Wilco to then being like okay I've got to look after myself on this mad climb while Rowan Dennis is having like the absolute ride of his life. Actually, before that, even as a team, we'd like discussed you know, the possible situations of like, yeah, what happens if uh, Wilco can't follow or what happens if I can't follow, you know? So we, we as a plan, like, knew what we were probably going to do in that situation. Also before the Stavio day, you know, like, I was, for me, that went, like, looking at the, at the stages on paper, that was the, the stage that really, like, stood out for me and, yeah, actually, like the night before, you know, I was struggling to sleep because I was just super excited right. uh, about that stage. About what you um, could do. Yeah, yeah. I was, um, yeah, I just couldn't stop thinking about it, man. Yeah. You know, like uphill start, heaps of big climbs throughout the day, and then, yeah, and then uphill finish as well, you know. That's like sort of like my bread and butter. Mm. So, no, I was super keen. And, yeah, also the team, you know, we had, like, a real go-out-and-race type plan, which I also really enjoy. Mm. So, yeah, mentally, like, that day I was like, we're, we're winning this stage, you know yeah. what I mean? <laughs> Even, like, because obviously you're in that last, that last run, you're, it's just you, Taylor, and Rowan. Um, yeah. One thing I was interested in is when you're racing up the Stelvio and, like, you're on the limit, clearly you're, like, on the, almost on the limit. Did you get a chance to sort of like look around and sort of be like, wow, I'm racing up the Stelvio here in snow. I'm on the lead group. Yeah. Was, that, was that going through your mind at that time? Were yeah, you- yeah. Yeah, it was like big goosebumps moment, you know, like pretty, pretty sick. You just, you know, you got the, the lead car in front of you and then you just got like two Ineos boys going full noise. And you're getting the time checks and there's like massive names that have been dropped and, you know, you're putting like a minute and a half into them, that sort of stuff. It's like, whoa, this is going to be, this is like epic bike racing. But at the same time, when you think that you're so, you're also just full, you know, racing mentality and you're not trying to think about that too much. But yeah, it was pretty special and, you know, racing up Stelvio on the snow and ah, it's pretty magic, man. It's pretty magical climb and and trying to put on your jacket, unfortunately, which yeah. is <laughs> great. Yeah, like yeah. it's such, it's such a like mean, like a mean moment. <laughs> yeah. So did you were you just freezing cold? Was that all it was? You just no, nah, actually, it wasn't that cold at all. You know, because we're going we're going full gas up Stelvio for like an hour, so your body's like pretty warm actually. Hmm. 
Yeah, there's a few factors there. I gave like I gave the that white jersey Castelli long sleeve, not the team one, but the the race jacket to the Swanier to give to me, and also put like some gels in the left pocket, three or four gels I think. Oh, okay, so it was like waiting it weirdly for you. Yeah, it was really way down on the left side. The sleeves are like quite tight on that. And I put my long finger gloves on before I put the jacket on. And it was just like everything that could have gone wrong was going wrong. And it was all caught like on video. And I'm just thinking like, shit, this is going to be embarrassing. I can just feel, I can just, I could just feel the memes coming on, you know, like <laughs> when, when I, we were going for like 500 meters and I still couldn't get my right sleeve, my right arm in the, in the sleeve. But, yeah, in the end, it, was, it wasn't too bad, you know, because I was, I was like on a wheel going down the descent, so it didn't matter too much. And it wasn't, yeah, it looked cold, but it wasn't too cold, you know. But yeah, it yeah. was a bit. Because the commentary... Definitely looked, definitely looked pretty grim. And also, yeah, yeah I definitely got a few messages off <laughs> friends and family saying like, what the hell, like lost years of my life watching that sort of thing. <laughs> But yeah. the, the commentary team in the UK were like, because I, I don't think you got yours done up on the descent. And then Wilco yeah. was having problems and had to descend without a jacket. And the commentary team yeah. over here were like, oh, that's it. Like, they're going to be so cold. That's them lost the stage. But obviously, you proved them wrong because you went and won the stage. <laughs> Didn't really matter. But um, you, you spent a long time with Teo and Rowan on that day where it was just the three of you. Did you, because you know Teo quite well, because you're the same age, grown, like, sort of raced each other obviously Rowan's a fellow Aussie did you chat at all or was it literally like head down game face yeah I didn't speak to them until uh, uh sort of like until the Cancano climb so I didn't really speak to Rowan you know because he was also going like full yeah he, you know he was going full TT mode and yeah Taylor yeah he was just on the wheel you know it was, it was actually even just riding on the wheel that day was super hard yeah you know in between the two climbs like you said, man, Ron was on, he was on like another planet that day and the Sestria day. He was pretty incredible, you know, but yeah, no, it wasn't, wasn't very uh, social. <laughs> wasn't, wasn't a very social last 50 K that's for sure. And then, yeah, you know, I said, if you, me and Toe were talking a little bit on the Cancano climb, but also not too much there. Cause I guess he knew the score. Cause at that time, you know, that Wilco is still going to go into pink. So you're just like, oh, obviously you're going to sit on the wheel. Whereas, other riders would have made like made a massive fuss, but it seemed like Taylor just got his head down and was like, "I know the score, you know the score." We we'll just ride. Yeah. How was that getting yeah. into the the team bus at the end? Because like Wilco's lost two and a half minutes, but he ultimately did enough to finish in pink. So in your head, yeah, you're like, I'm I'm the strongest rider here, but we've got the race leader. So that weird yeah. kind of feel. Yeah, it was definitely a weird situation to be in. And also pretty strange, like after the finish, you know, because on paper it looked like we nailed it, you know, like we won the stage, we went first and second into GC, but then at the same time, we, yeah, we didn't, I mean, we didn't not nail it, but it just wasn't ideal that Wilco wasn't, um, wasn't with us there in the finish, you know, and yeah, you know, I, got asked a lot you know like could I have uh, attacked on the on the Cancano climb or whatnot but at, at the time yeah it was a pretty hard call to make from the DS's and I sort of just followed what the DS's were saying mm. but in hindsight I think yeah maybe if I if I did attack then we would have gone up Cancano a lot quicker and potentially Wilco maybe wouldn't have gone into the jersey you know mm. so it's hard to it's hard to say and yeah, I don't know. I mean, personally, it would have been nice, you know, maybe to attack on Cancano. But yeah, that isn't to say that I would have, I would have gone into pink that day either. You know, I think Thayer was still riding super strong, and I think to get away from him on that climb would have actually been pretty hard. So yeah, it was an interesting. It was an interesting day. But yeah, also super cool to like, you know, get my first World Tour stage win. Yeah. And like at the Giro and on that day, you know, yeah, not necessarily like the way I would have wanted to win it, you know, just sitting on the wheel the whole time. But yeah, at the end of the day, it's bike racing and, you know, Taylor's not wearing a Sunweb jersey. I'm not wearing an Ineos jersey. He also did that 
to me on uh, Bianca Valo. So I don't think there was any like hard feelings, you know. It was sort of just like we're here to race bikes and he's a friend, but at the same time, we're not on the same team. So Yeah. And so let's fast forward to the end of like you get to the end of Sestri Air stage and you're in pink, which must be like a huge, mad amount of emotions knowing that you're going to wear pink into the final stage. But then as soon as that finished, you were in Taylor on dead heat, like incredible to watch as a spectator, but must be fucking nerve wracking for you, uh, knowing that you've got one more day and you're in the race lead. And basically everyone's saying, oh, it's Teo's to lose, it's Teo's to lose because it's a better time trial. It must have yeah. been a situation for you to go into that last day with like people around you going, I mean, the, the team wouldn't have been saying that. The team would have been bit backing you up, and rightfully so, but people being like, oh, you know, it's Taylor's to lose. That must have been such a, a hard, was it a hard thing to get your head around that you were doing that? Or Yeah, it was, it was just, like I said, the past, the last like three, four days of the Giro was just mental. And yeah, actually, just to go into pink was sort of just like crazy in itself for me. And it wasn't on the last day, it wasn't, it wasn't, I wasn't like super nervous or anything like that until I went to the start ramp, you know, and then it really like sunk in that there wasn't going to be, there's no more guys like starting after me or anything like that. And you're like, last guy. I mean, I never last guy in a TT, you know. <laughs> so that was like, that was really cool. But yeah, just, I, I also wasn't focusing uh, like on the end result. Well, you know, I was, I was like, man, I could win this. But at the same time, I just wanted to do the best TT of my life sort of thing. And um, I, have to, I, was... I have to give you credit because, again, in that Decisive Week documentary, there's a bit where you're talking to, I think it's Matt Winston. And you're like, yeah. it's just before the TT. And you've got quite an old head on young shoulders because a, a lot of guys could have like had complete head loss at that moment. And you were like, no, you yeah. know what? I'll go out, I'll give my best. If I win, I win. If I lose, I lose. And he's trying yeah. to like be like, oh, how do you want me to play? And you're like, just if I'm down on time, tell me I'm down. Like, don't don't tell me something that's not happening. So that's quite that's that's quite impressive. It must be quite impressive for the team to see that you had like where for all to just be like understand the situation. I don't really like being realistic, but at the same time you gotta you gotta be realistic in bike racing and yeah, I mean, I, I knew it was going to be, the, you know, the odds were like stacked up pretty hard against me on the last day there, but I just wanted, I didn't want like any, any like bullshit from the team. I just wanted them to tell it how it was, mm. at, like in the, in the radio there on that, in, in the TT. And they did that, you know, it was, it was pretty like agonizing, you know, when you know you're not going to, when you get into like the last couple K there and you know you're not going to win it, you're still down and, but at the same time, it was still one of the coolest things I've ever done on the bike, you know, like rolling through Milan in head to toe in pink. It was super special. And yeah, you was... got to stand on the podium as well. So it's not, yeah. like, it's not like you completely put convictulated. You went from maybe 10th, like being like, oh, could I get 10th to, oh, I finished second, <laughs> maybe like 50 seconds down on pink. Yeah. So that's a, you got to take that as like a massive. Tip. Yeah, exactly. I mean, that that was that was just like a dream come true, you know, to just be like at the Giro racing with the big guys and like throwing it down and, and yeah, finishing on the podium. But at the same time, you know, when you're that close, when you're like 15, 15K away from like winning the Giro, it's really like bittersweet, you know, like it's, it's disappointing. But at the same time, I can really appreciate like standing on the podium. And I know, you know, some guys work their whole career for that and never never get the chance to do that so for yeah for me to do it in in my my third grand tour was super special and like i said yeah hopefully it opens up some doors like later in in my career yeah you only have to look around at like some of the other riders that race like jakob fool saying rafa michael they're like proper old pros now and they've never done what you've done in your third grand tour in getting on a g grand tour podium so that's like that must be quite a good thing to take away from that race. That you've got guys like Full Shane so a super experienced pro who's been knocking on that door and you're you've turned up your third grand tour and came second. And it's it must be good, yeah. good for the ego anyway. For like my confidence, you know, it was massive. It was just like a massive boost and I just like the biggest thing for me though was just to be able to like 
race with you know the top 10 guys there that because that was like sort of like my goal of this year just to consistently be within that top 10 climbing group and yeah to be like one of the guys throwing it down it was just like dream come true sort of thing just just to be able to do that so is, so, is, it, is it convinced in your head now are you are you convinced that you've got what it takes to be like a to win a grand tour so you because you uh as a junior you were very good you like podium at the baby giro you know uh, fifth at tour de l'avenir so you did all the right things as a junior and now you've done it as a, a world tour pro are you like okay now i can probably target a grand tour going forward yeah well, i think so for sure i think it definitely yeah you know if you've done it before why can't you do it again type thing yeah is that the so, is that the first step or is there is your next step now like okay next year all guns blazing for pink or are you like okay baby steps maybe go and try and win terreno or a one week race and do another good ride at a grand tour or is it now just like full four war into grand tour uh, i think a bit of both yeah <laughs> maybe uh i uh, definitely like i said i mean you, you you really have to show yourself early in the season as well i think with those week-long races in preparation for for the grand tour but yeah I, now I, for sure I'd commit, you know, my life and career to trying to win a grand. So I, yeah, I think, you know, to get so close and not do it is definitely like, a, yeah, it's definitely like a bit of a teaser, you know, <laughs> but definitely once we coming back for more. So I'll, yeah, for sure. I think it, it's going to be a big goal of mine to be able to do that again. Um, but be on the top step and you've got the uh, you'll have the opportunities because obviously Wilco's leaving at the end of the year um, you've got Roman Bardet coming on board which will be really interesting because he's a he's a really different character and he'll probably bring something different to the team but apart from that there's not many like out and out GC guys at somewhere so you probably will get the opportunity to target the Grand Tour that you, you know you want if you want to go Giro if you want to go to Welter, there's no one else you're not in like any off where there's like 20 guys who have all won grand tours um, yeah you, you've got you've got a team where you're quite young ambitious but ultimately you're the you're the gc guy i guess yeah yeah oh, i think it's going to be pretty interesting with with Bardet coming in you know i don't actually know him at all really but from what i've heard he's super super good dude so looking forward to hopefully doing some races with him and learning off him as well and he's a he's a yeah, big, like, rug, big rugby union fan oh yeah right he, huge yeah, rugby no. union fan yeah yeah i thought that's like yeah. one of the only things i know about him yeah no nah, no nah, i do right do right rugby yeah but <laughs> um yeah also like you mentioned you know it's a super young team and pretty ambitious and yeah like the world scene this year there's definitely there's definitely a massive crop of talent at sunweb coming up and yeah, it's not. It's really nice to be part of that, and uh, yeah, I think next year it's um, it's going to be interesting, you know, with Bulko leaving and Sam Uman also leaving. Mm. So I think next year it's really, it's like yeah, the ideal team for me to be in to get my own opportunity at some some bigger races. So this is this is quite interesting actually because like la- I remember this time last year you were like Tom Demoulin was leaving the team. And I remember, like a lot of my colleagues in other magazines and, st- and other like press were like, "What is Team Sunweb next year?" Because the guy, the big guy, the marquee guy, has left. Um, and it was, a, and if you look at the team, everyone was under twenty, un- under thirty. That wasn't Nico Roach and Chad Hager. So it's like, hang, yeah. on, hang on, what's happening here? And then, so look at it now. <laughs> yeah. You you've just came second at the Giro. Mark Hershey's had an insane tour and Ardennes Classic. Soren Crag wins Tour de France stages, and you're suddenly this like incredible team that's had a revelationary year. So why yeah. why is that the case? What's happened? I don't know. It's hard. Yeah, it's always hard to put a put a finger exactly on what it is. But I think you know those guys. They also haven't just come out of nowhere you know they've all those guys have always been around the mark when you look at the names that you just said mm. you know like soren he's, he's always been around the market some of the classics um hershey you know he's a super talented guy yeah wilco he's also had a lot of good gc results at crown tours you know so i think i think it's not for me anyway it wasn't like 
a massive surprise about all these results because I knew th- these are really good bike riders. But yeah, like I said, it's been a funny year and I think, yeah, I don't know. Like we, we did a lot of work at Altitude before and I know not all the teams were able to do that. You know, we we did like a three-week camp up in Kutai in Austria and we had the full men's, women's and development team up there. And like not not every team can do that, you know. There's teams that are like potentially folding at the end of the year and yeah, our team can manage to do that and I think that definitely helps along with like the other resources that the team has with like nutrition, like dietitian experts and uh, yeah, bike fitting experts and all the trainers in the team. It's, it's like a real structured team and it, it's hard to say exactly what it is, but I, yeah. In terms I of, I, I mean, being British, a lot of the credit I've seen has been put at Matt Winston's like feet. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> and he's like, he's seen as like one of the bright young like minds of, coaching what was he like to work with because it definitely seems like for instance at the tour when you were going off and winning stages by having three guys attack and suddenly be out on their own They're like oh that's yeah. the mind of matt winston etc so yeah he, has he been quite important for for the team's successes this year and like their different approach to racing maybe yeah i think so i mean i personally really enjoy going to a race where matt's there you know and having him Having him in the in the cars, yeah, I don't know. It's just really nice, you know. He's good. He's good. Uh, good in in the race and off the race, you know. You can have like good balance with him, but he's also there to do a job like you are. And I think that's a pretty important thing, you know. You can you can enjoy a conversation with him, but he's also very professional at the same time. And I think that I think that's the case for a lot of our staff. Actually, also Luke Roberts is a pretty massive part of the team and I did like yeah I'd say oh, almost every race this year with him as the DS yeah so you just you're just super comfortable uh with him in the in the radio or in the meeting and you just know like his sort of style you know what I mean and you go to a race and nothing's sort of like a surprise or anything like that you're just very comfortable mm. with with what's going on you can just sort of like trust those guys and yeah just like really rely on them and another thing as well with Sunweb is like it the team's got not not a reputation but it's always had like a bit of a a thing with like for instance you're part of like the MPCC uh you don't like you don't take ketones which people make a massive thing about we've done our own science about it and we think well the guy like we spoke to said they're bollocks they don't work so which is quite interesting anyway he's like they just taste shit and don't do anything to you. But like, yeah. there's also like somewhere previously you've had riders who have just not fit into the, who have been a bit more eccentric and not fit into the mold. Someone like Warren Buggy, and then they end up leaving. So it, it feels like Sunweb's a team that does things a little bit differently to a lot of other teams in the peloton. And is a lot more like, not strict, but more rigid and they've got more processes in place and, and a kind of more like quite very transparent as well in the way they deal with stuff as well. Yeah, yeah, which is, I think, with the transparency, but that was also a big reason why I wanted to go there as like mm. a neo pro, you know, and just really, yeah, just not, you know, I like, I sort of had my um, like standard of working, you know, as a bike rider, and I wanted to just maintain that and didn't really want to be like influenced by anything in terms of like the yeah the team's like way of working you know it's it's very like it, it's a german registered team but it's like a very like dutch mentality of like they have the team has their way of working and if, if go, you don't okay. if you don't fit that then you know you can you can always race somewhere else it does and it and, it, and it's indicative like it doesn't matter how good that rider is so yeah. it's not like it's a oh we'll make an exception because this guy's super talented it's like no we have a away and if yeah. you're if you're 21 or 35 you've just got that's yeah. your the way you got to work yeah that's also like a big thing eh? i think they they have their structure and and yeah you can really just rely on that and trust it or you can you know 
do your own thing and maybe it's not as good. But I think, yeah, at the end of the day, their way of working is actually pretty scientific and pretty structured. And I think, it, you know, if you, if you follow it, then it, it can definitely help you a lot, you know? Mm. So before we go, I want to talk to you. So I always like to, because you're a new writer, we don't know much about like you and like your background and stuff. But yeah. so I was reading in an interview, you, uh, you credit Cado Evans as like one of your big sort of inspiration mm-hmm. heroes. So, I think he was fifth, you were 15 when he won the tour. So that must have been quite a big marker for you growing up, seeing the only Australian to ever win a Grand Tour happen when you were probably most impressionable. At- yeah. It was also pretty cool, actually, because we, we were actually at the tour oh, really? that year. Yeah. So we, like, that was actually the first year I ever watched the tour, like, live, you know, in France. Um, and, yeah, it was pretty sick you know we, we just watched a few stage a few of the mountain stages and stuff mm. um and then yeah we went to belgium and did some racing there and that was like the first time i ever raced in um in europe and then yeah we were watching you know Cadell win the tour i think with that last time trial on yeah. the second last day i think it was and that that was just like massive you know not only because an aussie won it but because yeah we got to watch it for, i got to watch it for the first time and it was just like just nuts you know and i think when it, when an australian guy does something like that it really uh just inspires like a whole nation type thing yeah you know because oh, yeah. Yeah. we had, i mean we had the same two years like a year later with bradley so yeah. i can i can i can i would definitely appreciate that whole like Cycling's not a big sport in Australia, but you have someone do something really special in the sport and then it becomes a talked about thing. But for you, you're already yeah. a cyclist, right? So you're already like, um, you're already racing and stuff. So you, you knew the sport, right? Yeah. I mean, I'd start riding road bikes, I think, when I was like six or something. Well, I started riding when I was six and then, you know, went down to the velodrome and did racing there and yeah, just like racing locally in Perth in australia um yeah how so how did you get into that so like you're from perth which is a an afl city and like australia loves sport but cycling's you know probably not even top 10 in terms of probably what's on the sports headlines so how did you like happen upon riding and and cycling yeah so my old man used to race and he's actually from from Manchester, so oh, he's English. Indian. Yeah, half English. Oh, we'll we'll um, play that. <laughs> <laughs> nah, nah, he he was yeah, he was just like a massive influence, you know. He, you know, guys like Eddie Merckx and Fausto Coppi and stuff. They're just like they're just like gods to my dad, and then they were just like household names when I was growing up. So yeah, he also taught me, you know, like the history of the sport and everything, which is pretty cool and yeah so he he sort of introduced me to cycling and and then i used to watch the racing on tv and then it was sort of just like well i want to do that and he just him and my mum just like backed me 110 percent you know all throughout school i didn't i didn't want to do anything else you know i just wanted to be a bike racer and what's riding in perth like because this is probably ignorant but when you hear about cycling in Australia, it's normally either in Adelaide or people moaning about how bad it is to cycle in Australia. Like road cyclists saying it's quite dangerous because of massive trucks yeah. and like bandit, men, bandit people in like the, the outback. So what's it actually yeah. like in Perth to ride? Uh, oh man, I love it. I think maybe, cause it's, maybe just because it's like home or something, you know, maybe if you went there, you'd be like, oh, this is a bit average. But it's... Yeah, it's just it's just really nice. Also, whenever I ride there, it's usually summer, so the weather's really nice. Um, but yeah, you, you have like actually in Perth, you have really good you have a really good bike path system. So if right. I wanted to, I could do like three hundred k on a bike path and not have to touch a single bit of road. No, I wouldn't do that, but I could. <laughs> um, and there's also there's also yeah, like a really good bunch bunchy scene, you know. Right, yeah, yeah. So back when I was younger, I used to do 
I used to do the bunch rides in in the city like almost every day. You know, you, there's almost a a big bunch ride like leaving the city like almost every day. Or back then there was that was also a massive part of just like my training. I used to just ride into the bunch rides, do a bunch ride, and then ride home. And I'd have like you know 150k. Yeah, they're also full gas bunch rides. And I'm guessing um, they were with like adults, and you were like a teenager. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All like the the weekend, the Perth weekend worries and stuff. But I mean, there's some good riders, uh, like local riders in Perth, mm. and the bunch rides. Are, I would I would say the the racing scene in Perth wasn't that great, but the bunches would definitely make up for that. And right. guys would just come on to these. Every everyone used to do them. So guys like Luke Durbridge and Michael Freeberg and Rob Power. Me and Rob Power, mate, we used to do these bunch rides like religiously. You know, we'd just go rock up and just go full gas for like an hour and a half on these bungees. Yeah. Is it flat? Is like Perth quite, is it, what's, what's the terrain like though? Is it? Um, round, round the city and the river is like pretty flat. But then I don't know if you've ever been to Adelaide, but it's quite similar to Adelaide and just more, but like more spread out. Right. You've got like the coast, then the city, and then behind the city, you got like the hills and the hills are pretty... Yeah, I would say there's no, there's no climbs like longer than 10 minutes. Mm. Okay, so that's like like living in the UK here actually, which is ironic because like Teo, for instance, who your rival, he's from where I am. Like, yeah, yeah, accent oh, there's, no, there's no climbing. There's no, yeah, like you're doing like maybe six, seven minute efforts. So it must be weird knowing, growing up and being like, okay, I'm the physique and I know I could be a, a climber, but... <laughs> It's all over after yeah. 10 minutes. Whereas you go against, you, you know, you raced against Egan Bernal as a kid and people like David Gaudu who like grew up in the mountains and an idea yeah. of an easy ride for them was probably up like a 20k alpine ascent or, or for Bernal yeah. altitude or something. Yeah, it was pretty weird, especially like the first time. Yeah, so like the first time we came to Europe, you know, that you were watching the tour, I think it was 2011. That was like... You know, I, I think the first mountain I ever did was tor- the Tourmalo. Right. And we were riding up that and it was just, uh, what is it, like 20K or something. And I'm just thinking like, wow, just 20. When you think about it, it's nuts. Like 20K all uphill. Yeah. It's a long time, you know, to be riding uphill. And I was like, that that was just sick because I, I really loved climbing. But then in Perth, you know, all the, everything's just so short you don't have a climb really with like a single switchback on it. And, and then you're going up like a mountain with all these switchbacks and stunning scenery. And like, were, were you like a duck to water? Like, did you hit the tourmalade, get beyond 10 minutes? And we're like, Oh, hang on. I feel far. Like this is yeah. exactly what I should have been doing the, the whole time. We, there were four guys there um, from Perth when, when we hit it, you know, and, we just went like full gas, but yeah, it was like an hour long, <laughs> and you're just like, wow, <laughs> yeah, it's a bit different to a bit different to just going like ten minutes and then getting to the top, you know. As you said, like growing up in Western Australia, it, Western Australia is having a great time at the moment because you and Ben O'Connor at NTT. It's like the yeah. new the new Colombia, uh, new Slovenia, um, but. Um, <laughs> It must have been weird growing up. I guess you didn't know many people at like school weren't into like bike riding, weren't into cycling. Were you like the only one who had this oh, mate. weird oh, mate. with this sport? Yeah, I mean there are a couple there. There was maybe like one other guy in middle school or something, you know, that used to ride. But yeah, when you're like the only bloke in like year twelve with shaved legs and <laughs> puts his liker on on the weekend, it's not like it's not really a normal thing, you know. Yeah. And yeah, when all your, when all your friends are playing like league or AFL or oh yeah 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 yeah, <laughs> it's not like a normal sport at all in Australia. But I definitely remember back in high school, you know, people were just like, "Oh, you're one of those." you're one of those annoying cyclists that like people hate sort of thing. <laughs> you just, I used to, yeah, you used to cut like a fair amount of shit for it. But yeah, pretty funny. Like looking back on that stuff now, but yeah, at, at the same time, it never really, never really like affected me, you know, like I knew what I wanted to do and that was it. Even, even if it meant I had to shave my legs. <laughs>
And I, I saw, I went, I was on your Instagram earlier and I saw that you went to a, a Girona football game recently. So are you, are you, so importantly, because your dad's from Manchester, are you a City or a United fan? Oh, mate, United, United for sure. So, Jai Hindley, ladies and gentlemen, uh, one of a trio of very interesting names on the three spots on the Giro d'Italia podium this year. I thought it was quite strange. You had Teo, Wilco, and Jai. It's kind of like a phonetic... Millennials. Oh, millennials. Yeah. It's the phonetic alphabet has somehow triumphed in Italy. But yeah, good value customer he was, wasn't he? Do you reckon that was the, the smallest amount of... Um, Syllables, smallest, smallest it? amount of syllables, and the highest number of uh, the highest concentration of vowels, highest vowel vowel to consonant ratio that's ever been seen on a, yeah. to a podium. Yeah, but there was very long for for the very short f- four names. There's very long surnames in Hindley, Kelderman, and then Teo, and then there was Gagan Hart. Can you spell Gagan Hart? I can actually because I have to do it quite a bit. <laughs> Go on then. But I'm not gonna. <laughs> what can you use that in a sentence? Gagan Hart. <laughs> Uh, but no, he, yeah, he's, uh, he was a, he was a, he was a, he was a top lad. I did um, enjoy his uh, little tale about having the uh, the what's it ripped out of him at school for shaving his legs. Because I imagine that yeah. being that that type of sports person in Australia growing up was possibly quite tough. Because it's quite it's a, in the nicest possible way. It's quite a macho culture in Australian sport. Well, it's, it's, a, it's a society that loves sport and the sport that it loves are all physical contact sports. Yeah. They're, it's rugby league, rugby union, Aussie rules. Um, there's a bit of cricket, but even cricket for the Aussies is contact. Yeah. <laughs> it's at least shouting at people. So it's to be, but to be fair, then that reflects a lot in Australian cyclists in the peloton. You know, as we heard a couple of weeks ago from Connor Swift, who's the guy who barks orders around the peloton? Yeah. It's the Aussie. It's yeah, Richie yeah. Port. Who's who's the guy? Who's, who's the guy who shouted "Don't touch me" and hit a, a journalist, Cadell <laughs> Evans, yeah. an Aussie? Like these guys, I think it's you know it, it might be stereotypical to to band all the Australians together, but they are quite straight talking. But that makes them so much good value. And like chatting to Jai and him giving some of the answers about whether he should have sat with Wilco or should have attacked himself, whether he has any regrets. You know the fact that he's like. I knew I was going to win on the Stelvio stage. That's like such a, it's so refreshing to have an answer from a pro that's not like, I want to thank my team. Yeah. You know, I tried my best. Yeah. yeah. You no, know, that robotic answer. And he's half English. He's a mank. Yeah. So we can claim him. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. If, as, when. But I did definitely sense that he had swallowed a very bitter pill with uh, the situation with Wilco Kelderman, which uh, you can probably talk through much better than I, but effectively, found himself in a position where he could have attacked, but attacking would have put time into what was then the uh, Team Sunweb's first place virtual virtual pink rider. The thing is, is it, the entire thing is if, what's and maybe. So first of all, they've gone to that race with Wilco Kelderman being the leader of that team. Team Sunweb's leader. Jai Hindley was protected, but as he says, Wilco was the guy who has experience in Grand Tours and was going to win the race. The only caveat with that is, is that Kelderman's leaving at the end of that season. So he's leaving that team. So riding, going all in for a rider that within, at the end of that race will no longer be a member of that team. It's probably a weird circumstance, not only for his teammates, but also the staff in the car. Anyway, then he gets, you know, before the Stelvio stage, I'd say that Kelderman was probably the strongest GC rider in that race. Mm -hmm. You know, he, he launched a big attack on Etna in the first week. Um, he looked really good on the first stage that Teo Gagenhart won. So, but then obviously he then gets dropped on the Stelvio and Hindley's riding away. And it's so obvious that Hindley and Gagenhart are the strongest riders in the race. So he's like going to be in this mad emotional state where it's like, what do I do? But if he, and then the, as Hindley said, if he had attacked, there's no suggestion that he would have dropped Gagenhart. You know, he could have attacked, blown up, and then got dra- dropped by Dennis and Gagenhart and not even got second on the podium, not even got that day in pink. So I think he can't probably, he can't live in regret and live in, live in the past and in hindsight about what he should have done. I think he did everything. And I think the team, Team Sunweb, did played it exactly how they should have. You know, they had Wilco in pink. They then brought Jai a second on GC. They entered the last day of the race with the race lead. And unfortunately, 
the better man won in that time trial, and that was Gagan Hart. Yeah, and that that's the bottom line. I mean, that's the thing. We shouldn't take anything away from Teo because he rode a fantastic time trial, and he well, he rode a fantastic Giro. Yeah, it's not like it's not like um, this meant that. Yeah, as you say, if if uh, if as when maybe all that kind of stuff. It's not like Hindi would have definitely won. So a lot of that was down to Teo. What I loved about Gagan Hart and about Hindi in this race. And he touches on it in the interview. And it's very similar to what Pogacar did in the tour, is that these young guys didn't get their result by a bit of chance. Like, they didn't get in a breakaway that happened to finish 10 minutes up the road one day. And then they just kept losing time, losing time. And by the end, they were on the podium. Or they didn't, you know, accidentally finish on the podium because there was a massive crash that took over, out a load of the favourites. Okay, Tom Graham and Thomas and Simon Yates had to abandon two of the biggest favourites in this race. But every mountain stage, the last two big guys on the climb were Gegenhart and was Hindley. And in the same with Pogacar in the tour. So it was just, you know, these were the two strongest riders in the race, and they're 24, 25, and this is just how it is now. It wasn't luck, it was just pure ability. Which I loved, and and they all both raced in a quite aggressive, exciting fashion, which is something we should really take um, sort of happiness in because bike racing can be quite boring. But this young generation of riders, of which these two are both part of, I think don't have that sort of defensive bone in their body. I think that if I think bike racing is going to be very high octane and very exciting for the next couple of years. Yeah, definitely. I think that's I mean what you touched upon at the beginning, being sad that the racing season's over. Partly it's because it's just been really exciting. Far more so than in other years. There have been incredibly tight finishes. There's been you know leads overturned on the last day. Uh there have been crashes, there have been breakthrough names. Um it has has just been exciting. And I think that goes for a lot of sport actually. If you look at uh, football there's in, incredibly high scoring games in football uh, it, it seems like I don't know the, the sports maybe go through kind of eras where there is just a culture where it's just like no actually we all ride as a team we're all very conservative we plan things out and maybe now the culture has changed to being like no you just you know, cat amongst the pigeons just blow it open and see what happens and yeah these guys are doing that they are riding kind of fearlessly really yeah. Talking of riding fearlessly, we should probably give a little nudge to our next episode that's coming up in a fortnight. So James and I will be chatting to Alex Dowsett soon, someone else who experienced a good Giro on stage eight, but he just recently announced that he will be taking on the hour record again. He's going to go after Victor Campenarts' 55.039 kilometre distance, which is an absolute mammoth task not least because Campanats set his distance at altitude in Mexico and Dowsett will be attempting it at sea level in Manchester. But we're going to get him on the show to talk through why he's taking on the hour record again, how he thinks he'll do, what his prep's been, and just about this crazy season where he didn't have a contract for a very long time and he's now re-signed with Israel. I think that'll be a really good interview. So do come back and listen to that one. Um, if you enjoyed this episode of Jai Hindley, do share with some of your cycling friends. Uh, leave us a review on Apple or wherever you get your podcasts. Um, if you think we're doing good stuff, let us know. It's always nice for our egos, but also good for the podcast because we'll be sitting up higher in them charts. And we want to catch our competitors, um, definitely. So do leave us a review when you can. Um, and if you've got any queries or if you've got any sort of anecdotes, just get in touch with us at cyclist at dennis.co.uk. And we'll, you know, maybe even send you something out as a, as a thanks for being the first person to get in touch with the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> the first, yeah, exactly. You can have some uh, homemade butternut squash soup. Exactly. Um, but for now, I'm going to let you go, James, and enjoy that sunshine. And uh, I'll join you again soon. Wonderful. Lovely speaking with you, Joseph. See you next week.